So we just read from Nahum chapter 1. And um, we get there a picture of God, you know, jealous, verse 2, revengeful, um, furious, um, taking vengeance on his adversaries and reserving his wrath for his enemies. And then balanced with that in verse 3, we, we read that he is slow to anger. And so we see that, yes, God is slow to anger. God is merciful. But if we don't get the balance right, then we, we, we won't appreciate the severity of God. Because there comes a point when enough is enough, where God is, his, 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 his mercy, if you like, has ceased. And the transgressions have come to the full. And God will act and will not be mocked. And I know it's not fashionable to talk about that, but, you know, I was asked to talk on this subject, so we're going to talk on it, all right? Because, you know, we can't afford to not appreciate the fact that the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. But fools, it says in the proverb, despise wisdom and instruction. In other words, if you're prancing around not fearful... According to that proverb, you're a fool. And the word fear, I know we sometimes dampen it. We mean, does it mean respectfulness or reverence? You look at that word fear. It means to fear. It means to fear. But that, yes, we have a loving God. And we're very thankful and gracious. But we should never presume too much. We should never puff ourselves up. Because he is a consuming fire, as we shall see. He's extended his love to us and his mercy, but we have to bear that in mind. What does it say? To this man will I look. What man? To the proud man standing there praying, you know, I wish I, I'm glad I'm not like this publican by the side. No. To the man who's trembling at God's word. He can't even lift his eyes up to heaven. That's what God wants us to appreciate and be like. And, you know, I think if, if, if we, we've got to get that balance right. We've got to not overstep the mark. It's very hard. We all do it. And I'm not saying it as if I'm some sort of really humble, loving, sort of perfect man by any stretch of the imagination. But that is what the word of God teaches us. That that is what God is after. That humility from us all. Remember what it said in Romans 11. You know, if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. In that context... It said, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell severity, but on thee goodness, notice, if thou continue in his goodness. It's a conditional statement. God is good to you if. And we can forget that sometimes. We can be like, oh, anything goes. And that's where, you know, you do get some of us, and we're all at different points in our lives, kind of can swing to either side of that goodness and severity. You know, I think, you know, uh, with society around us, it's very easy for us to swing to that goodness like anything goes, like it's totally fine. But we have this severity aspect as well. There is an echo, says Eileen Genders. I don't know what to do about that, Sister Eileen. Lovely to uh, hear from you. Where's the camera, by the way? Over there. Lovely to see. I, I don't know what to do about that. Yes, it is, yeah. Yeah, so, sorry about that, Eileen. Um, we'll see what we can do. Um, probably me, I'm probably talking too loud for the system to cope. But, um, that's nothing not unusual there. Right. So, you know, we have the, the severity of God, don't we? Now, what had happened, what was Nahum about? Nahum was um, at the time when uh, the Assyrians were going to come down and God's prophet Nahum, he comes and explains to basically Israel at this time that there was going to be this terrible judgment from God. And uh, he explains, doesn't he, that God is slow to anger. You've had a chance. It's not like God's just doing this suddenly. You, you know, he's slow to anger, but this vengeance is going to come upon you. The mountains will quake. And although it was the armies of the Ninevites, uh, sorry, not the Ninevites, the, um, the Assyrians that were going to come down, and it, it, it's, it's God who caused it to happen. So notice in verse 5, the mountains quake at him, at God. So God was in the armies that were coming against his own people to bring judgment upon them. But notice in verse 7, Yahweh is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. So even though there was this judgment that was going to come on Israel, there was a remnant 
to whom goodness would be shown. It's the same in, in Romans chapter 11. It talked about the remnant. So yes, punishment was going to come on the nation. They were under a national covenant. But there was this remnant. Now, now they'd forgotten God. Uh, all the prophets speak about this point. It says here in Hosea 4, you'll, you'll remember this one. My people are destroyed for what? For lack of knowledge. And because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. You know, God has revealed in his word what he wants us to appreciate about him, of his principles. We say, uh, we'll take the good bit, the mercy bit, the forgiveness bit. We'll take all the good squishy stuff. The other bit, we'll re we, we'll, we won't look at that bit. We won't think about that. We'll reject that bit of knowledge that's been given to us. Well, we can't afford to do that, can we? We've got to understand the wholeness of God. It says in, in Deuteronomy, beware lest thou forget Yahweh. So we mustn't forget God. It's, it's crucial that we take the full counsel of God, the whole counsel of God, the knowledge that he has set forth in his word. And we have to appreciate that God, the God we worship, is this God. The same God in the Old Testament as the New Testament. The Bible doesn't hide the fact that God is supreme, sovereign, and in control of all things. Even the bad stuff that happens in the world. It says in Amos, you know, shall there be evil in the city and I have not done it. God, God knows it. He understands it. He controls it. It says he creates darkness. He, make, uh, he, he forms the light and creates darkness. I make peace and create evil, says God. I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith Yahweh. And that's righteous and right. It's not popular for us to think that. But that is what the Bible has declared. If these things jar, it means our understanding, our knowledge, our appreciation of what God has done and is doing might be a little bit swayed to either the left or the right of that goodness or severity. We've got to try and get a good perspective. It's hard, though. It's very hard for us to do, as we've said. So we're going to focus now on, on that severity side. The truth bit. Um, we'll mention this now. Often God's mercy is set to one side and his truth is set on the other side. In other verses, I'll show you them in a minute. And so the truth side often comes down on severity because we're not very truthful. And, and it means, because we're not truthful, that God is by no means going to clear us if we're guilty. And he is going to visit the iniquity upon us if we fall down against his truth. So let's have a think about um, these aspects. We've got that truth side. By no means he clears the guilty. And he visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. So first of all, the truth side. You know, God is a God of truth. We, we looked at that passage before in, in Jeremiah 17. You know where it says, um, you know, the heart of man is... Is, is desperately wicked, desperately sick. Who can know it? Uh, we know that, that, that lies and deceit are part of humankind, human nature. But opposed to that, we have a God of truth, mercy and truth. You see that there in Psalm 25. Psalm 57, God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. The two parts, the goodness and severity of God. Psalm 100, for Yahweh is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. And that classic one in Psalm 85, mercy and truth are met together. God's the perfect balance between the goodness and severity. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The righteousness, the truth, the true correctness of God, and the peace that comes after that. Um, is there. So we have this idea of, of truth. Now, what I think is fascinating when you, when you think about this, that, that God is a God of truth. It says in Deuteronomy 32 verse 4, doesn't it? God, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. He keepeth truth forever, it says in Psalm 146. He is the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, it says in Daniel 4. And God is not a man that he should lie, it says in Numbers 23, verse 19. So that's great. 
That's one of the principles of God, his key characteristics. He's a God of truth. We can trust in him. And so he has revealed himself in the word of truth, hasn't he? That which is noted in the scripture of truth, it says in Daniel 10, verse 21. When we get into the New Testament, it's fascinating. You know, for example, in Thessalonians, where it says to, that the Thessalonians received the word of God, which he heard of us. When they received it, you received it not of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. God's word is truth, Jesus tells us in, Ma in John 17, verse 17. The truth of the gospel, it says in Colossians 1, verse 3 to 5. So we have, don't we, this, this God of truth, who revealed that truth in his word of truth. And so we can trust that word, that revelation to us, which is absolutely wonderful. There's some of those, those principles that we've noted there. So you can see how these things, um, these things go forward. God is a God of truth. He manifests himself in his word of truth. And so we now can trust him in what he has declared. We've talked about the righteousness of God before. He is right. We can trust in what he tells us. That's the message of the Bible. He's outside of humanity. And why would we want him to be like us? Why would we want deceit and we're not sure if really he means what he says or whatever? No one wants that. We want a God of truth. We can't trust anything else other than truth. It says he would by no means clear the guilty. What does that mean? Well, he's not going to acquit somebody who is guilty. We've got these passages on the screen that that he is a righteous God. He's going to give every man. Jesus is going to come with God's judgments, as we know. It says in Revelation, he's going to come to give every man according as his work shall be. We've all got to stand before the judgment seat, haven't we? And uh, give account to what we've done in our body. And, and God is the righteous judge. And he gives that judgment and extends it to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. And he's going to by no means clear the guilty. He will not be deceived or mocked, it says in Galatians 6 verse 7. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But there's a flip side to this, isn't there? Because if God is righteous and the righteous judge, we also have comfort in that. Because it means... That no innocent person, if we're trying our best, if we're accepting the goodness of God extended to us, if we're trying to fulfill his principles, that we won't be condemned. And so we do actually, you can look at this two ways. We do actually have, um, you know, uh, the, the aspect of God's mercy on his principles to comfort us in those things. He is just and a justifier of those that believe. Now, this uh, next phrase, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Now, you know, you think, hang on a second. That's not fair, is it? Like if my great granddad did something pretty bad, what, what, why, does, why does the iniquity of great granddad come down and strike me? And also, how does that equate, that phrase in Exodus, with these passages? In Deuteronomy 24, it says, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. So, so you're not, Deuteronomy says, you're not going to be guilty for what great granddad did. You're going to be put to death for your own sin. It says the same in Ezekiel, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. You know, this is where they were saying that the, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and our teeth that set on edge. In other words, you know, because what our parents did, we're suffering the consequences. God says, no. He says, the soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So how do we understand then, in Exodus chapter 34, this, uh, this, uh, this kind of phrase of attribute to God's character, which says, look there, you know, that he is going to visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children. Well, I've got a suggestion, and that is there is an answer in other parts of Scripture. So if we go over to uh, Exodus, Exodus 20, verse 5. So what does it say here in Exodus 20, verse 5? Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, this is graven images, nor serve them, for I, Yahweh thy God, am a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquity, and here's our phrase, of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So we have the assumed knowledge here when you get to chapter 34 that that's what's meant. This is on families that hate God. And they won't be, um, they won't go unpunished ultimately in the ultimate judgments. The same is, is um, in Deuteronomy 7. Uh, flick over there just so that we can see it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord Yahweh thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And then... Um, Verse 10, and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. And so I think that's, what, that's what's being implied here in the severity of God in these words. That, that he will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children and children. But, but they're responsible for it. They, they have hatred for God is the implied attribute there in, 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 in that verse through these other ones. And so we have this, um, this quoted, don't we, as in the passage our brother quoted, uh, read for us in Nahum. God is jealous. Yahweh revengeth. Yahweh revengeth and is furious. Yahweh will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Yahweh is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Who are the wicked? They're the ones in Israel that actually hated God's ways. They rebelled against him. They forgot about him and they'd gone completely in the other direction. They'd accepted the ways of the nation. They hated God. They didn't want to read his word anymore. They'd moved on. And so God says, in this instance, I'll bring my judgments upon you, the nation, as was part of his righteousness. And so we, we, we get that coming, coming through again in, in the other verses there. Who will can stand before his indignation? Now, I want us to have a look at these. I want us to keep, you're here in Deuteronomy. Um, just flick back to Deuteronomy chapter 5 and look at verse 9. This is um, talking about the law about having other gods. Verse 8 says, Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. So this is the law of Moses to the nation of Israel. Don't have any other gods. What happens if we, if we do that? Verse 9, thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them, for I, Yahweh thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of, his, of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So there it is again. And so we have this warning that God is a jealous God. You know, he is the right judge and he is righteous. He created all things. And if a creature in his creation rebels against him, he has the right, doesn't he, to, to judge that person, that creature. I've got this phrase that the destiny of man is really to conform to the will of God, to humble ourselves, to accept his sovereignty, his rulership. And if we don't, then we incur God's righteous judgment. And so he resents, doesn't he, the insults of men. He resents men that hate him, that rebel against him, that don't want anything to do with his glory. And that's right, because he created them. So those that ridicule God, ultimately God is going to judge them. He is jealous for his own honor and his own glory and his own righteousness and his own praise. He, he, he requires that from his creation. And when it doesn't happen, he will judge them. Ultimately, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, in their mortal lifetime, other times it will wait to the judgment seat. Have a look at this. Um, if you're in Deuteronomy, have a look at chapter 6 now and verse uh, 15. For Yahweh thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of Yahweh thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. And again, this is in the context of other gods, that God is jealous for his for his righteousness, for his glory. So we've got to bear that in mind, that the same God exists in the New Testament. You know, what does it say? We, 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 we've, we're obviously quoting from the Old Testament and God's dealings there with Israel, and they were under a national covenant, as we know with him. 
We know that they fell in the wilderness, didn't they? After the plagues of Egypt, they came out and that generation uh, passed away. We're told in Corinthians the reason that they, they've been put down on record for us. And the reason is, is that we need to realize that what's happened, the way God treated Israel is there to teach us about God, that we don't learn from their mistakes. They were there as our examples. Why? To the intent, it says in Corinthians, that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. They forgot God. We mustn't as well. We, we, we sometimes can boast ourselves against the natural branches, can't we? But, but we mustn't. That's the reason we have the Old Testament, for us to appreciate the severity of God. These things happen unto them for examples. They are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world, the age, are come. Wherefore, let, us, let, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. And there's a great example of this in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. Perhaps we could have a quick look at this. Because in 2 Peter th chapter 3, this is written, of course, um, in the build-up to AD 70, when the Romans were going to come and destroy the Jewish commonwealth. And uh, Peter is writing here. Um, well, who is he writing to? Well, if you look at... Uh, uh, first epistle of Peter, chapter 1 and verse 1, he's talking to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So these are people who've been selected, and we believe as, as the context as you go through is these are, are Jewish converts who've accepted Christ. These are the Christadelphians of the first century. And, and Peter, obviously, his, his main ministry was to go to the Jews, um, and these were the Jews that he'd, he'd, he'd been working with and who'd been converted to believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it says in verse 1, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So they had the knowledge of God, and he's going to stir up their minds to remember that knowledge. Verse 2, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. What were we to be mindful of, Peter? Verse three, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So there were some in the Ecclesia who were saying, where's the promise of his coming? Now, there's lots in here that we, we could unpack. What, what coming? What last days were they in, in verse 3? Well, th th there's, you've got to do a lot of study. It's not our subject today. But I'm just going to give you a couple of things maybe to go away and follow up. Because this term, the last days, is used of our last days that we're in. But in the New Testament, often it actually is re in reference to the last days of the Mosaic order. The last days, as Brother Thomas called it, of Judah's commonwealth. Because there was still a temple and there were still sacrifices and there were still priests and they had to be removed for the Gentile era to begin. And so that era of time, the Mosaic period, was to be done away with. And Jesus himself had spoken of that in the Olivet Prophecy. And there were some who were scoffing. Now, they were saying, where is the promise of his coming? Now, that's a, 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 tr a tricky one to unpack. But what you'll find is, um, I've put the passages on the screen, if anyone wants to pick this up and have a look at them afterwards. What you find is, is that Jesus often spoke of his, his coming in the armies of AD 70, in the armies of the Romans. Like God came down and was in the armies of the Assyrians in the time of Nahum. It's the same principle. It's the same type of language. So Christ was going to use the, 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 the armies of Rome to destroy the Judean commonwealth. And in fact, in Daniel chapter 9, it's prophesied, and the Romans are actually called the people of the prince, the prince being the Lord Jesus. So we believe that that's what it's talking about there. But, but anyway, by and by, this is the point. They, there were these scoffers basically saying, where's his coming? 
For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And we can, we can take that principle and we can see it around us all around us, can't we? You know, we could even have that, if we're not careful, in our hearts. Like, hey, everything's just carrying on as it's always carried on. You know, God's not really going to judge everything, is he? You think, well, hold on a second. What's the warning? What was the warning to those Jewish Christians? Verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. You say, look, you've forgotten the severity side of God. Look, remember the flood. God completely wiped that out, wiped all of those things out. Brother Thomas calls it the antediluvian age, before the flood. All of that was washed away. It was gone. It perished, as it says in verse 6. But then look at this in verse 7. But the heavens and the earth. And now, this is, um, I should have explained as well. This is symbolic language. Heavens and earth represent the ruling powers. I'm sure we know this. And the, the citizens of those ruling powers. That's, that's the cosmos. It's like a sim symbol, a, book, a, a load of symbols. There, I've put some verses on the screen there. You want to take it away to see that that is how Scripture uses those terms. So we have the heavens and earth of the antediluvian age, the time before the flood in verse 5. But then we shift to the heavens and the earth, which were now. And the context here is that Jewish heavens and Jewish earth, the, Ju the Jewish rulership and the citizens of that, and they are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And we know that's the case because in verse 10 it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements, and these, by the way, are words only ever used of the Mosaic order, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? So judgment was coming. What manner of persons were they going to be? The, the elements of the Jewish order was going to be destroyed. The heavens and earth destroyed. It is symbolic language. We, it has to be, don't, and we know that as Christians. It's because God has promised never to destroy the heavens and the earth, hasn't he? In fact, um, the Seventh-day Adventists, I think they were called Millerites, they, they wrote to Brother Thomas. And they said, you're talking about the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. You're talking about this kingdom on the earth. What load of rubbish, Mr. Thomas. Because we have a verse here that says the earth's going to be dissolved and the heaven's going to be destroyed. And so Brother Thomas sits down and writes the last days of Judah's commonwealth. And if you've not read that, you, when I read it a few years ago, it absolutely blew my mind. It opened up the whole of the New Testament in ways that I'd never seen before. So I thoroughly recommend it. So it's a bit of a slog. It's not a long book. It's a bit of a slog. The language obviously is, is old, but it will enlighten you into, into some amazing things um, based on the word. But the point here is that those people were scoffing. And we've got to be careful. We can't keep sitting in the, the goodness side. We've got to remember the severity of God. We've got to remember that God is a God of judgment. And that is what they weren't doing. And that, yes, he has promised, verse 13, a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. But that is based on his goodness and his severity. I just want to mention one other thing. It says in verse 9, seeing as we're here, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But is long-suffering, there's a word from our character of God, to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so there we have the goodness of God. Now, now, who are the usward? I, I don't think it's everybody. Sometimes we, we hear in lectures, oh, God doesn't want anyone to perish. Well, that might be the case, but he's, he's talking here to those who have been called the elect, as we pointed out from 1 Peter 1 verse 2. God doesn't extend the call of the gospel to everybody, does he? He selects the principle of calling and selection, those to come into contact with it. And then he doesn't want any of those to perish. And that's comforting to us, isn't it? We've been called by God. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to be in his kingdom. He is a God of severity, but he is a God of love and he's selected us. 
Now, what manner of persons ought we to be? It says there in verse 11. Now, Brother Thomas, just quickly, from the last days of Judah's Commonwealth, says this. This was the faithless objection of professed Christians who were willingly ignorant of the great example of the eternal spirit's long-suffering and sudden and unexpected overthrow of human society and the catastrophe of the flood in the cities of the plain. Hebrew Christians of the first century, so this, these people here, in the very presence of the apostles themselves, like Gentile professors and Jews in the 19th, so like people in our day, have become scoffers and vain and light, frivolous, worldly and treacherous people. They scoffed at this idea that there is a coming judgment. We've got to be careful that that doesn't happen in our ecclesias and our community. We've mentioned this, that God's goodness is extended to us as a condition. This is it in Colossians. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard. So we have to be careful. We have to keep the truth as best we can, not move away from it. Now, there's loads of things that we could look at in terms of God's severity. Um, we've looked at quite a few of these, um, you know, and hinted at these before. I think it's just worthy of note to say that God is a God of vengeance. He will repay, it says. And so it's not up to us to take that into our own hands, is it? It's us, up to us to leave things to God's divine rulership and to his justice, which ultimately will come. And those judgments will come. Now, it's interesting. There's the great prophecies that we often speak about. In Ezekiel 38, for example, with the uh, battle of Armageddon, Gog and Magog. And then if you ever noticed in there that there's quotes in there from Exodus, from the character of God. It says, my fury shall come up in my face, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. And so God is a jealous God. He is going to act. We can't be scoffers and say, oh, when's it going to happen? It's never going to happen. It is going to happen. It says in Thessalonians, doesn't it? The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And so we know that that's going to happen. We know that this is the righteous judgments of God. You know, we can think about Daniel chapter 2. The stone destroys the image, grinds it to powder, smashes it to smithereens, and it blows off like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the explanation to that is that God is going to come and set up a kingdom, and it will, it says there, break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. Everything around us, all of the pride and pomp of man, is going to be completely destroyed. That is, that is what the Bible says. And we've got to keep that in perspective. The world cannot offer us anything. You know, the whole of the book of Revelation, when you really study it, comes down to the judgments of God. The judgments of God and the seals, the trumpets, the vials, and also the unwritten thunders. There's judgments against uh, Eastern Rome, uh, West, Western Rome, Eastern Rome, I think it's the other way around. The vials that are poured out on, 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 on um, the, uh, the development of Christianity, so-called. And then we have the, the thunders, which were not to be written. They were so, it seems so terrible. I think it's just worth just keeping our perspective. Just flick over to, to Revelation 14. Now, we obviously can't do a full exposition of the whole book of Revelation. But think about, we've got to keep into perspective God's righteousness, God's severity. As we say, we often hear, oh, the God of the New, the, the God of the New Testament is different to the Old Testament. Is he? Really? Does he never talk about judgments in the New Testament? Is it all, is it all grace and mercy and love? No, it is not. You just have to understand the book of Revelation to see this. You know, if you look at the book of Revelation, chapter 14 particularly, I mean, we mentioned chapter 10 and the thunders, which are uh, John's not allowed to record because they're so terrible that they're going to be met out upon the world. Well, in chapter 14, we have um, uh, the grape harvest, the, the grain harvest and the grape harvest, which is in symbol given. Now, we, can't, we don't have to go through all the symbols. We believe that these are two judgments on the earth, symbolically um, described to us. And what does it say in verse 20? The winepress shall be trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles in the space of a 1,600 furlongs. This is the judgment of God in the, in the New Testament. 
You want something a bit more explicit? Look at Revelation 16, our time. Look at verse 12. We know it's our time because the power that occupied the Euphrates has dried up, the Ottoman power. It's dried up. And so this is our day, the sixth vile period. And uh, we, we read, don't we, of the, the fog spirits that are coming out of the mouth of the beast and of the false prophet and the dragon in verse 13. And they're going to come and gather all the nations. They're going to gather the, the nations to battle the kings of the earth to Armageddon, as it's called there in, uh, in verse 16. The great battle of God Almighty. And we know what that means. A heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. This is a judgment scene. And we go back to Joel and we get to understand it's all the nations that come against Jerusalem. They're going to be destroyed. And we connect that with Ezekiel 38. This is the same God in the Old Testament as in the New Testament. And when we come to uh, the seventh file, which is after the great battle that takes place, it seems that there's further judgments that take place um, throughout um, throughout the world after Armageddon, I think this is now in reference to the uh, to the to the grape harvest that we saw in chapter fourteen, and it's extended further. And notice this. Look at this. It says in verse seventeen, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven and the throne, saying, "It is done." And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. That's the political earthquake that we talked about in some symbol, a complete change. Because this is when the kingdom is being established. Such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city, this is um, Babylon that we think, was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God. The false worship, the false religion comes to the remembrance before God. To give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found and there came upon men a great hail out of heaven every stone about the weight of a talent the men blasphemed god because of the plague of the hail for the plague thereof was exceeding great now these are all symbols yes but can you not see this is the judgment of god and it is in the very message of christ in the book of revelation so don't let anyone tell you that the new testament is not like this final one this is the final picture of christ on a white horse in Revelation 19. Look at verse 11. It says, I saw heaven open. This is after Armageddon. This is now the righteousness of God being established on the earth. I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. This is a picture of Jesus. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and the name is called the Word of God. This is the Word made flesh. This is Christ himself. And the armies which were in heaven, the armies of the saints, we know that the saints are with Christ, Zechariah 14, 5, Psalm 149, verse 9. This is us. This is if we've got that right balance between the goodness and severity. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. They've been given the righteousness of God. They've been given eternal life, and they're with Christ. And what are they doing? Verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. It's a fearful, fearful picture, isn't it? This is the severity of God manifesting Christ, manifesting us, God willing. But it's there. And so this is why we have to get this balance right, because the work of the true saints, when, God, when, when Christ returns, one of their works is to execute the judgments of God. And if we've got the balance wrong, if we're all full of goodness, we'll be no good for the severity side. We've got to try and get that balance right. And we've got to manifest that now. Now, one of the hardest parts, I think, of Scripture for the modern mind to get their, cell, their brains around is imprecatory psalms. What's an imprecatory psalm? It's, it's a psalm that calls, um, it's a technical term, it, it means to call upon, a curse upon somebody, basically, imprecatory. And we say, well, 
Could we really, refl- is this really the word of God? Is this how God wants our mindset to be? Is this something that we can adopt and reflect back to the Father? Look at this in Psalm 5, the morning psalm. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth, the wicked. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulchre. They flatter with their tongue. Now, could we pray this? Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. You think crumbs. It's pretty harsh, isn't it? But we know God is going to do that. Every time we pray for the kingdom to come, we're praying for that stone to smite the image and grind it to powder and obliterate it to smithereens. We can pray for the kingdom to come. This is getting a bit more pertinent, isn't it? Destroy thou them. And we say, oh, maybe that was just, maybe that was just David's opin- opinion. Except, of course, Psalm 5 is quoted in Romans 3 and adopted into the New Testament. And quoted as an authoritative reflection of actually how we should be thinking. And what we should acknowledge about what's, what, what humanity is like. And the same is, uh, we're not going to go through all of, all of these, but look at this one, Psalm 69. A prayer to pour out thine indignation upon the wicked and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. And we say, oh, don't know about that. Don't know if we could reflect that. Well, maybe we've got that goodness and severity a bit wrong because Psalm 69 is authoritative, it's quoted by Christ, it's quoted um, there in Romans and by Christ, it's quoted um, in, in John very quite a few times there, John 19, um, when Christ is on the cross, it's quoted, uh, in fact, we actually read it with our brother earlier in Romans chapter 11, um, and it's adopted into the New Testament as authoritative, as something that is true, that is right. And so we need to get the right balance between the goodness and severity of God. We must, as the psalmist exhorts us to, hate every way that's false. That's what we've got to try and do. When we think of the greats in scripture, Phinehas scouring those two, how did he do it? Because he had the right mindset of the goodness and severity. Samuel Hacking Agag to pieces. We think this is awful. From a human perspective, yes. But they had the right balance. And you say, well, what about Jesus? Jesus never did anything like that. Really? What about when he went into the temple with the scourge of cords? And he turned over and he whipped them and he got them out of the temple. Those people who were bartering and making his father's house um, uh, a den of thieves. And so there is such a thing as righteous anger. And there is such a thing as as, get, uh, you know, as, as making sure that we hate the false way. In fact, it says in Corinthians, doesn't it? If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. Now, is that our mindset? When we come across people, they hate the Lord Jesus Christ. They hate God. They hate everything that we stand for. Let them be accursed. Of course, we want them to repent. Of course, we want them to see the goodness of God. Of course, we'll help them in any way we can to bring them in. But if at that point they don't want it, then we have to fall back to the severity of God. But having said all that, there's also a word of warning that we must deploy because we have these passages. We have to be careful how we judge. Judge not, says Jesus, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. The goodness and severity We're trying to all uphold the righteous princes of God. As we say, we can sway the way, but we've got to be very careful because it says that God will be merciful to the merciful. And Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. So my suggestion is that if we have to make a judgment one way or the other, choose mercy. As long as it's within the the scope of, of, of divine, you know, of the scriptures, because there must be an element by which we're allowed to deploy either goodness or severity for these verses to make sense. And we need to be very careful how we treat one another, particularly uh, our brothers and sisters who've also been called like we are from the nations around to be a people for God's name because God has showed them goodness. 
And so although we've been emphasizing severity in this second study, we must temper that, as we say, with the stuff that we learned in the first study of God's mercy and his goodness. But the severity is there nonetheless. Now, we can go too far. I don't know if anyone's heard of this group. They're called the Westboro Baptist Church. They're pretty crazy. They go around um, uh, and they picket fence, you know, all sorts of things. And they're pretty vile, to be honest with you. Um, and they, they, they've kind of gone too far on the severity side. They go to soldiers' funerals uh, in America and, um, and, and say really, you know, quite strange things about, you know, this must be God's judgment on your family and, and you for fighting for America and, and so on. And uh, they, they, they basically have got really sadistic. They think that, that almost like God enjoys judgment upon people. Um, and uh, it's pretty awful. In fact, I wrote to one of them and she wrote back and I said, you know, some of the things you say I can understand. But <laughs> what about these verses? Okay, because God's attitude is not one of enjoyment and pleasure at the destruction of the wicked, which you seem to be saying. She didn't respond. by the way. Well, she didn't reply after that. And I quoted some of these verses. Look at this, Ezekiel 18. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord Yahweh. He doesn't want the wicked to die. He will cause them to die if they hate him and if they rebel against him. And it is righteous that they die because they're full of sin. But he doesn't really want that way. He doesn't want to go down there. I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. Very clear. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, says God. So we've, we've got to get the balance right. There is the goodness and there's the severity. But God is not sadistic. He doesn't want to torment people so that they die. He gets no pleasure out of their destruction. Now let's uh, finish our thoughts because we've been thinking about some quite fearful things. But I, I want us to, to just bring it back around. Just come to Malachi. Because... Although that all goes on and the world around us is going to be destroyed and God, Christ is going to come and there are going to be these judgments and we must keep that in mind and we must tremble at God's word and we must be fearful. We can also have great comfort, can't we, brothers and sisters? Two final verses and then we'll have a bit of tea, hopefully, God willing. Malachi chapter 3. Now, you'll know this one because Malachi, of course, has been... Again, bringing um, uh, quite a serious message, mainly to the priests of Israel and talking to them about how they failed and how judgment is going to come upon them. And he wants them to repent and turn back to God. And again, we have um, so we have this little lovely saying here um, in verse 16. Then they that feared Yahweh spake often one to another. So this is the remnant. They were there, they were speaking to each other, and, ver and it says, And Yahweh hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Yahweh and that thought upon his name. And so these were the ones who were meditating upon the character of God, he who will be, and, and they were meditating upon his name, Yahweh, and all that that meant, that how is the goodness and severity of God and his characteristics, how is it going to be manifested in the future? And they thought about it and the book of remembrance was, was created and their names are in that remembrance book. We believe that, that our names hopefully are in that book, brothers and sisters, because we're the ones that are trying to understand God's ways. We, we're doing it so in, in such a failed way, no doubt. But we're trying. And then look at this in verse 17. And they shall be mine, saith Yahweh of hosts, in the day when I make up my jewels. And notice there the name of God, the, the Lord of hosts, the Yahweh of armies. So this is the, the sort of a God represents, revealing himself as a, an army. In the day that I'm basically going to be an army, I'm going to remember them. When I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. So at that point, we'll get the full balance correct. What does it say in chapter 4 and verse 1? For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And so the severity comes to them. They shall burn them up, saith Yahweh of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But, that's the severity, verse 2, unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the store. So don't you think that's absolutely wonderful? That there's this remnant 
We hope it's us. We're trying to understand God's name. We're trying to manifest it in our lives today. We're trying to get a good perspective that, yes, we extend love and mercy through the call of the gospel. But we, we do so not by going fully over one side and saying, well, anything goes. We're trying to get that balance right because in verse 3, ye shall tread down the wicked. This is in the kingdom age. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith Yahweh of hosts. And so we have that warning. Now, our final passage, just to kind of finally comfort us, because it could be quite a scary thing for us to think about. And I, 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 you know, it is, as I say, we do tread carefully. It's in, it's in Romans chapter 8. It's a famous passage. But we must be reminded that we have been called out of the nations who are destined as a whole to be destroyed for the stone power to replace them with God's righteous kingdom. And that isn't going to be a good thing for them. But we have another destiny before us, brothers and sisters, because we rely on the love of God and we want to uphold his righteous principles. And what does he say to his faithful followers? He says in verse 37 of chapter 8, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We're going to, through his righteousness, we're even able to conquer sin and death, the last enemy which will be destroyed through God's love and mercy, extended to us, balancing his perfect righteous principles. And then we get this in verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, brothers and sisters, we've done our best, I know we've covered an awful lot, but we've done our best to try and make sure we get the complete picture of God's character. But we leave this place with this thought in mind, that God has called us to, to a destiny that isn't destruction, to a destiny to be part of his Yahweh name in the age to come, and to be like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who we pray will come most earnestly.